Hey, and welcome to the lecture. Before we jump into the learning, just a quick reminder to check out the workbooks available on modernoptician.com through the Ultimate Apprentice Optician Study Guide or available on Amazon worldwide. It's the best way to accompany this lecture so that you can fill in the blanks, label the diagrams, do everything all concurrently and elevate your training to the next level. All the links to the workbooks and the website are all in the description down below, so make sure to check it out. Other than that, enjoy today's lesson. All right, let's talk retinal pathologies. So we've talked about refractive uh, elements uh, in the last couple, and we're going to continue with you know one of the biggest ones, you know, the retina being extremely important to vision. We talked about the cornea, we talked about the lens, and we talked about problems that we can see. Now, retinal pathologies are, um, are conditions that we don't necessarily see unless we're involved in the intraocular exam. Sometimes you're going to get, you know, direct retinal imaging, the VRI, or, you know, there's different things like OptoMap is a, is a common one, which is basically a wild, a wild, wide view or wide angled camera that's able to see the retina, <clears throat> um, you know, diagnostic imaging like OCT. These are all things that are going to be able that allow the, the doctor to diagnose, to detect, to manage retinal disorder. So you're not likely going to see a lot of this stuff from a day to day basis. However, uh, it is extremely important for us to understand that the moment there's a problem with the retina, there's a problem with vision, and then we end up having to counsel and manage it from the vision standpoint. Remember, right, just because we're not part of the clinical diagnosis and clinical treatment, we are part of the visual treatment of these disorders. And unless you understand them, you may not be able to fully uh, understand what's going on in the vision and also give the proper recommendations and counseling and use the proper products or techniques to solve these issues. So very important for us to understand retinal pathologies. And I haven't really included any images here because I don't want the images to uh, distract us from the main goal here and understanding what's happening and how it's affecting vision. All right, so let's jump into it. So first, let's talk about vitreous detachment. This is going to be the most benign of all, but I wanted to talk about this first because it is something that happens on a regular basis. And I want you to understand where this is coming from. So the vitreous detachment occurs when the vit vitreous shrinks and tugs on the retina uh, with enough traction to cause a break in the tissue. Now this is often accompanied uh, by the sudden onset of symptoms such as floaters and light flashes. Why is this important? Because um, this common abnormality, and it's usually happening because the vitreous starts to liquefy over time, and starts to become more viscous and can move around. This mimics, all right, so we're gonna put mimics a retinal detachment. And most of us and most patients are aware of this concept that if you see flashes of light and you have increased floaters, rush to your nearest eye care professional or to the hospital because you may be having a retinal detachment. Now, a lot of the times it's just a, a vitreous attachment and it's not a big deal and the patient is just, you know, sent on their way and told it's okay, you'll be all right. However, they don't know that and neither do you. So the moment that you have things like an increase in floaters and light flashes, you have to refer immediately for further examination. And hey, maybe it's just a vitreous attachment, not a huge deal, but the symptoms mimic each other. So it's very, very important. All right. So I wanted us to understand this concept of vitreous attachment, even though it's not a huge deal. Uh, we have to be aware because it mimics the retinal detachment, which is defined by the presence of fluid under the retina. OK, now this occurs when fluid passes through the uh, retinal tear uh, or like, you know, just a compromised area of the retina, causing the retina to lift away from the underlying tissue and lifting and kind of ripping off this will have the same symptoms, um, <clears throat> such as the floaters and light flashes, and even like a curtain, we call it like a curtain of darkness, 
curtain of darkness. This is very serious, right? Retinal detachments need to be detected and addressed immediately. That, <clears throat> that area that's ripped off has to either be compressed back against the walls of the eye uh, using, you know, either the infusion of, of fluids such as oils or even a small balloon that's going to help, uh, and sometimes laser treatments to try to tack it back. However, retinal detachments are extremely uh, serious and concerning and have to be addressed right away. So any kind of symptoms of, that we've talked about have to be referred and people have to be treated and, and looked at right, right away. Extremely important, all right? Now, uh, what about diabetic retinopathy? So we know, if you've spent any time in eye care, you know that diabetic patients have to be examined on a regular basis. And the main concern, now there are other things that happen in diabetes. You know, you can have a change of refractive error. We can, you know, there's a thing called uh, index myopia where sometimes the, uh, the makeup of the, um, the aqueous humor and the lens and everything because of the increase in, in um, blood sugar levels can change the index of refraction of all these parts and it could change vision. And there's a number of things that could be happening in, you know, this is a very much, this is a systemic disease. There's a lot of things that could be happening, but one of the main things that happens or one of the later on in diabetes is that you have a deterioration of retinal capillaries due to increased blood glucose concentrations. And this leads to leakage into retinal tissue. Uh, worst cases lead to, to proliferative, I always have a hard time with that one, proliferative neovascularization and vision loss. Isn't that a mouthful, right? Proliferative neovascularization. Basically what this means is that, and this happens all over the body, uh, increased blood sugar levels actually have a very negative effect on blood vessels, on vasculature. And these little blood vessels, these little capillaries can't handle it and they start to burst and they leak fluid out, okay? Now, leaking fluid, basically bleeding, right? So bleeding in the eye. So when you get a little bit of blood that spills out, two things happen. First of all, it can create pockets uh, and tatters on the retina, which we know the retina has to be pristine in order to be able to see properly. So that can have visual implications in that particular case. The other thing that happens too, because of this leakage, there is a hormone or a cofactor inside of blood called uh, VEGF. So it basically means that when there's blood that spills out into tissue, this hormone says, hey, we don't like loose blood, so why don't we build new blood vessels to encapsulate this and to allow the, um, the blood to find a path? Now, if this is happening inside the retina, it's building all these new blood vessels, so that's where proliferative, meaning it's happening a lot and it's moving around, neovascularization, new formation of blood vessels, uh, this can actually cause a number of things. First, these new blood vessels could interfere with the matrix of the retina and what allows it to, to see well or like to capture the image. Secondly, it can actually disrupt the retina and cause all these pockets behind it and it could lead to a retinal detachment. So there's a lot of problems uh, that come associated with uh, diabetes. Diabetic retinopathy is a big one. Um, so the symptoms are, it's, it's very much in like, you know, you know with the case of any kind of uh, degenerative disease, the symptoms are not immediate and they're not necessarily, as these bad things are happening, they don't manifest themselves as visual problems. So patients absolutely need to be examined on a regular basis uh, so that these things can be caught before it's proliferative and before it's too much of an issue and things can be treated along the way. What else we got? So how about an epiretinal membrane? This one's a little bit, not rare, it's actually quite common, but it's a, it's a small one, um, a small one, sorry. It's something that we don't discuss on a regular basis, what I'm trying to say. But an epiretinal membrane is a delicate tissue, um, tissue like scar or membrane, um, very much like, like, like cling wrap, like a cellophane wrap lying on top of the retina. And uh, this is another, and this is kind of like a, a genetic or like a, 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 a thing that happens primarily later in life, um, just a degenerative thing, but this also can pull up on the retina and distort vision and can also cause, uh, you know, problems such as detachment or, or bleeding or just, or swelling behind uh, the tissue, you know, fluid leaking in because it's pulling up on it. So an epiretinal membrane is another common uh, occurrence. And actually, if it gets significant enough, 
the doctor, the surgeon can actually go in um, and pull that little membrane off, uh, you know, and loosen, loosen it and pull it off so that the, it could expose the healthy retina underneath. Uh, retinal tear. Retinal tear is pretty common. It's a small defect in the center of the retina and it may develop from abnormal traction between the retina and vitreous. So we talk about the vitreal detachment. Well, sometimes it can actually cling on a little bit too much when it's pulling apart and rip the cornea. Um, or it can also happen from injury, from trauma and things like that. So all of the other things we talk about the retina, about having problems with bleeding and proliferative uh, neovascularization, having problems with, uh, with detachment, having problems with edema and fluid underneath, all these things are closely linked and we're avoiding all these things. So a retinal tear is something that has to be cauterized with a laser so that all these problems don't happen in the future. But it's still relatively common. Interestingly, things like this happen more often to high myopes because they tend to have big eyes. Remember, when I say big eyes, it's more the axial length of the eye. And think of it like stretched tissue okay so you're going to find that high myopes especially like super high myopes you know the minus tens of the world and and beyond they're more prone to this kind of stuff and therefore it's very important that their retinas are examined on a regular basis because again these things can happen very quickly and when they happen it's end game kind of stuff like you if you don't catch this and you don't treat it uh this could lead to blindness and macular degeneration well we could have done an entire lecture in macular degeneration, and I didn't want to because um, we're not treating this stuff. However, you're going to see this more and more often. Uh, you know, you're going to say age-related macular degeneration, ARMD. You're going to see this all the time. And as the tissue of the macula, which is the most important part of the retina, begins to deteriorate, uh, it causes symptoms such as blurred central vision or a blind spot in the central Field. And that's because the macula is the action center for all central vision and high definition vision. There are so many risk factors from smoking to UV exposure to diets to all sorts of things. However, I want you to remember something about age related macular degeneration, and it's all in this AR. It's age related. And it has to do with the fact that we are living longer. Okay, now this doesn't mean that we don't have to be, live healthy lives and we don't have to worry about this. However, if you have patients who are 80, who are 90, who are 100, I've had a few, um, they are likely to start having some signs of age-related macular degeneration. This is a serious condition and it is something that the whole field is putting a lot of time effort money research into addressing but it's primarily due to the fact that if you get old enough most tissue starts to fall apart right we can't jump as high or run as fast as we could when we were younger the same thing happens to the eye it just doesn't operate the same way and the tissue starts to deteriorate and die off unfortunate reality however it is nonetheless a reality um, and you're going to have a lot of patients who are being treated for macular degeneration now though the mechanism isn't the same the the concept is still very very similar to diabetic retinopathy you're going to see uh, dry versus wet meaning dry just means that the the retina and the macula is starting to deteriorate Wet means it's starting to bleed. And then you have the same issues as with diabetic retinopathy where you have proliferative, I'm just gonna put prolif because that's a big word, neovasc, proliferative neovascularization and you have all these issues. So actually what you're gonna end up seeing a lot of the time with, um, with macular degeneration is people are gonna go for injections, whoa, injections okay and the injections are actually anti vegf which is that hormone that says give me some more blood vessels so this is used to try to stunt the progression of wet amd okay anyways 
this is not something that you have to worry too much about. However, when you have patients coming in saying they're having injections done, now you understand why, right? Um, and that can be very helpful in understanding why your patients don't see as well, right? Because if they've gotten to the point where they are getting injections, um, and this is not always the case, but I think it's safe enough to be able to say to expect decreased visual acuity. Very few patients are gonna get referred to have injections, though people are getting injections earlier on because preventative measures are being taken. Um, but it, you know, for our purposes, it's rare that you're gonna see patients at the point where they're going for injections that they haven't had some significant effect on the macula and, the, um, and their vision, essentially, okay? So that's it, you know, pretty much for these different retinal issues. There's loads more. There are retinal specialists out there who focus hugely on all these different conditions. But for our purposes, these are the more common ones. But at the end of the day, we just have to remember that any retinal problem is a concern because it's going to affect vision. And again, why is this important to us? Well, exactly what I just said. Retinal dysfunction equals visual problems, okay? Anytime the, the retina is compromised, there will be an effect on vision. And it's not something, all right, cannot be corrected with lenses. We're way beyond lenses when we have problems with the retina. So you have to recognize that there's going to be some compromises that need to be made as far as expectation, as far as best corrected visual acuity, as far as the end result of what making in this person glasses is going to help. Very important to be able to understand that, very important to be able to communi communicate it as well, all right? Recognize acute versus chronic, right? Uh, acute, well, the main one is RD, retinal detachment, right? Uh, absolutely needs to be referred immediately and it's an issue. Chronic, all the other ones, all right? So ARMD, diabetic retinopathy, et cetera, these are chronic, doesn't make them less important or less, um, you know, significant. However, just recognize the difference between an acute problem and a chronic problem. Uh, health markers cannot be ignored, all right? This one is primarily going to be considered of diabetes, diabetic patients, okay? If their diabetes is not under control and things are getting worse, it's important to get these people in for an eye exam, all right? Uh, if, here's the way to look at it. Like the eye is always a concern in diabetic patients. If these people are having diabetic neuropathy, uh, if their blood pressure is not under control, if they're on insulin and they're, and you know, if, if basically, if diabetes is affecting their life dramatically, then you have to assume that it's also affecting the eye. And sometimes these patients, because there aren't any visual symptoms, may neglect routine eye exams. Um, and it could be too late by the time that things are noticed. And again, funny how it just bleeds into one or the other, right? So an emphasis on, emphasize the importance of routine eye examinations for these reasons, because a lot of this stuff is silent until it's too late. And we wanna make sure that people are give, being given the right advice. We are, after all, the first line of eye care. And if you can be good at giving good advice, not only, um, are you going to you know, potentially save some patient's vision, people will trust you and will you know, naturally be more drawn to you because of the good advice you've given them, all right? So I think that should do it for retinal problems or retinal pathology. Let's move on.